The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Book First, Chapter One, The Grand Hall. Three hundred and forty-eight years, six months, and nineteen days ago today, the Parisians awoke to the sound of all the bells in the triple circuit of the city, the university, and the town ringing a full peal. The 6th of January, 1482, is not, however, a day of which history has preserved the memory. There was nothing notable in the event which thus set the bells and the bourgeois of Paris in a ferment from early morning. It was neither an assault by the Picards nor the Burgundians, nor a hunt led along in procession, nor a revolt of scholars in the town of Laz, nor an entry of our much-dread lord Monsieur the King nor even a pretty hanging of male and female thieves in the courts of Paris. Neither was it the arrival, so frequent in the fifteenth century, of some plumed and bedizened embassy. It was barely two days since the last cavalcade of that nature, that of the Flemish ambassadors charged with concluding the marriage between the Dauphin and Marguerite of Flanders, had made its entry into Paris to the great annoyance of Monsieur le Cardinal Le Bourbon, who, for the sake of pleasing the King, had been obliged to assume an amiable mien towards this whole rustic rabble of Flemish burgomasters, and to regale them at his Hôtel de Bourbon with a very pretty morality, allegorical satire, and farce, while a driving rain drenched the magnificent tapestries at his door. What put the whole population of Paris in commotion, as Jehan de Troyes expresses it, on the 6th of January, was the double solemnity, united from time immemorial, of the Epiphany and the Feast of Fools. On that day there was to be a bonfire at the Place de Greve, a maypole at the Chapelle de Brac, and a mystery at the Palais de Justice. It had been cried, to the sound of the trumpet, the preceding evening at all the crossroads by the provost's men clad in handsome, short, sleeveless coats of violet camelot, with large white crosses upon their breasts. So the crowd of citizens, male and female, having closed their houses and shops, thronged from every direction at early morn towards some one of the three spots designated. Each had made his choice, one the bonfire, another the maypole, another the mystery play, it must be stated, in honour of the good sense of the loungers of Paris, that the greater part of this crowd directed their steps towards the bonfire, which was quite in season, or towards the mystery play, which was to be presented in the grand hall of the Palais de Justice, the courts of law, which was well roofed and walled, and that the curious left the poor, scantily flowered maypole to shiver all alone beneath the sky of January in the cemetery of the Chapel of Brac. The populace thronged the avenues of the law courts in particular, because they knew that the Flemish ambassadors, who had arrived two days previously, intended to be present at the representation of the mystery, and at the election of the Pope of Fools, which was also to take place in the Grand Hall. It was no easy matter on that day to force one's way into that grand hall, although it was then reputed to be the largest covered enclosure in the world. It is true that Sauval had not yet measured the grand hall of the Chateau of Montargis. The palace place, encumbered with people, offered to the curious gazers at the windows the aspect of a sea, into which five or six streets like so many mouths of rivers, discharged every moment fresh floods of heads. The waves of this crowd, augmented incessantly, dashed against the angles of the houses which projected here and there, like so many promontories, into the irregular basin of the place. In the centre of the lofty Gothic façade of the palace, the grand staircase, incessantly ascended and descended by a double current, which, after parting on the intermediate landing-place, flowed in broad waves along its lateral slopes. The grand staircase, I say, trickled incessantly into the place, like a cascade into a lake. The cries, the laughter, the trampling of those thousands of feet produced a great noise and a great clamour. From time to time this noise and clamour redoubled. 
the current, which drove the crowd towards the grand staircase, flowed backwards, became troubled, formed whirlpools. This was produced by the buffet of an archer, or the horse of one of the provost's sergeants, which kicked to restore order. An admirable tradition which the provostship has bequeathed to the constabulary, the constabulary to the marechaussee, the marechaussee to our gendarmerie of Paris. Thousands of good, calm bourgeois faces thronged the windows, the doors, the dormer windows, the roofs, gazing at the palace, gazing at the populace, and asking nothing more. For many Parisians content themselves with the spectacle of the spectators, and a wall behind which something is going on becomes at once, for us, a very curious thing indeed. If it could be granted to us, the men of 1830, to mingle in thought with those Parisians of the fifteenth century, and to enter with them, jostled, elbowed, pulled about, into that immense hall of the palace, which was so cramped on that sixth of January, 1482, the spectacle would not be devoid of either interest or charm, and we should have about us only things that were so old that they would seem new. With the reader's consent, we will endeavor to retrace in thought the impression which he would have experienced in company with us on crossing the threshold of that grand hall, in the midst of that tumultuous crowd in surcoats, short sleeveless jackets, and doublets. And, first of all, there is a buzzing in the ears, a dazzlement in the eyes. Above our heads is a double ogive vault, panelled with wood carving, painted azure, and sewn with golden fleur-de-lis. Beneath our feet a pavement of black and white marble, alternating. A few paces distant an enormous pillar, then another, then another, seven pillars in all, down the length of the hall, sustaining the spring of the arches of the double vault, in the centre of its width. Around four of the pillars, stalls of merchants, all sparkling with glass and tinsel. Around the last three, benches of oak, worn and polished by the trunk hose of the litigants, and the robes of the attorneys. Around the hall, along the lofty wall, between the doors, between the windows, between the pillars, the interminable row of all the kings of France, from Pharamond down, the lazy kings with pedant arms and downcast eyes, the valiant and combative kings, with heads and arms raised boldly heavenward. Then, in the long pointed windows, glass of a thousand hues. At the wide entrances to the hall, rich doors, finely sculptured. And all, the vaults, pillars, walls, jams, paneling, doors, statues, covered from top to bottom with a splendid blue and gold illumination, which, a trifle tarnished at the epoch when we behold it, had almost entirely disappeared beneath dust and spiders in the year of grace 1549, when de Brule still admired it from tradition. Let the reader picture to himself now this immense oblong hall, illuminated by the pallid light of a January day, invaded by a motley and noisy throng which drifts along the walls, and eddies round the seven pillars, and he will have a confused idea of the whole effect of the picture, whose curious details we shall make an effort to indicate with more precision. It is certain that if Ravaillac had not assassinated Henri IV, there would have been no documents in the trial of Ravaillac deposited in the clerk's office of the Palais de Justice, no accomplices interested in causing the said documents to disappear. Hence, no incendiaries obliged, for the lack of better means, to burn the clerk's office in order to burn the documents, and to burn the palais de justice in order to burn the clerk's office. Consequently, in short, no conflagration in 1618. The old palais would be standing still, with its ancient grand hall. I should be able to say to the reader, go and look at it and we should thus both escape the necessity, I of making, and he of reading, a description of it, such as it is, which demonstrates a new truth, that great events have incalculable results. 
It is true that it may be quite possible in the first place that Ravaillac had no accomplices, and in the second that if he had any, they were in no way connected with the fire of 1618. Two other very plausible explanations exist. First, the great flaming star, a foot broad, and a cubit high, which fell from heaven, as every one knows, upon the law courts, after midnight on the 7th of March. Second, Théophile's quatrain. Sure t'was but a sorry game, when at Paris Dame Justice, through having eaten too much spice, set the palace all aflame. Whatever may be thought of this triple explanation, political, physical, and poetical, of the burning of the law courts in 1618, the unfortunate fact of the fire is certain. Very little to-day remains, thanks to this catastrophe, thanks, above all, to the successive restorations which have completed what it spared, very little remains of that first dwelling of the kings of France, of that elder palace of the Louvre, already so old in the time of Philip the Handsome, that they sought there for the traces of the magnificent buildings erected by King Robert and described by Helgaldus. Nearly everything has disappeared. What has become of the chamber of the chancellery, where Saint Louis consummated his marriage? The garden where he administered justice, clad in a coat of Camelot, a surcoat of linsey woolsey without sleeves, and a surmantle of black sandal, as he lay upon the carpet with Jean V. Where is the chamber of the Emperor Sigismond, and that of Charles the Fourth, that of Jean the Landless? Where is the staircase from which Charles the Sixth promulgated his edict of pardon? The slab where Marcel cut the throats of Robert de Clermont and the Marshal of Champagne in the presence of the Dauphin? The wicket where the bulls of Pope Benedict were torn, and whence those who had brought them departed decked out in derision in copes and mitres, and making an apology through all Paris. And the grand hall, with its gilding, its azure, its statues, its pointed arches, its pillars, its immense vaults, all fretted with carvings. And the gilded chamber, and the stone lion which stood at the door, with lowered head and tail between his legs, like the lions on the throne of Solomon, in the humiliated attitude which befits force in the presence of justice, and the beautiful doors, and the stained glass, and the chaste ironwork which drove Biscornet to despair, and the delicate woodwork of Ancy. What has time, what have men done with these marvels? What have they given us in return for all this Gallic history, for all this Gothic art? The heavy, flattened arches of Monsieur de Brosset, that awkward architect of the Saint-Gervais portal. So much for art. And, as for history, we have the gossiping reminiscences of the great pillar, still ringing with the tattle of the patru. It is not much. Let us return to the veritable grand hall of the veritable old palace. The two extremities of this gigantic parallelogram were occupied the one by the famous marble table, so long, so broad, and so thick, that, as the ancient land rolls, in a style that would have given Gargantua an appetite, say, such a slice of marble as was never beheld in the world. The other, by the chapel, where Louis the Eleventh had himself sculptured on his knees before the Virgin, and whither he caused to be brought, without heeding the two gaps thus made in the row of royal statues, the statues of Charlemagne and of Saint Louis, two saints whom he supposed to be great in favor in heaven, as kings of France. This chapel, quite new, having been built only six years, was entirely in that charming taste of delicate architecture, of marvelous sculpture, of fine and deep chasing, which marks with us the end of the Gothic era and which is perpetuated to about the middle of the sixteenth century in the fairy-like fancies of the Renaissance. The little open-work rose window, pierced above the portal, was, in particular, a masterpiece of lightness and grace. One would have pronounced it a star of lace. In the middle of the hall, 
opposite the great door, a platform of gold brocade placed against the wall, a special entrance to which had been effected through a window in the corridor of the gold chamber, had been erected for the Flemish emissaries and the other great personages invited to the presentation of the mystery play. It was upon the marble table that the mystery was to be enacted as usual. It had been arranged for the purpose early in the morning, its rich slabs of marble, all scratched by the heels of law clerks, supported a cage of carpenter's work of considerable height, the upper surface of which, within view of the whole hall, was to serve as the theatre, and whose interior, masked by tapestries, was to take the place of dressing-rooms for the personages of the piece. A ladder, naively placed on the outside, was to serve as means of communication between the dressing-room and the stage and lend its rude rungs to entrances as well as to exits. There was no personage, however unexpected, no sudden change, no theatrical effect, which was not obliged to mount that ladder. Innocent and venerable infancy of art and contrivances. Four of the bailiff of the palace's sergeants, perfunctory guardians of all the pleasures of the people, on days of festival as well as on days of execution, stood at the four corners of the marble table. The piece was only to begin with the twelfth stroke of the great palace clock sounding midday. It was very late, no doubt, for a theatrical representation, but they had been obliged to fix the hour to suit the convenience of the ambassadors. Now this whole multitude had been waiting since morning. A goodly number of curious, good people had been shivering since daybreak before the grand staircase of the palace. Some even affirmed that they had passed the night across the threshold of the great door, in order to make sure that they should be the first to pass in. The crowd grew more dense every moment, and, like water, which rises above its normal level, began to mount along the walls, to swell around the pillars, to spread out on the entablatures, on the cornices, on the window-sills, on all the salient points of the architecture, on all the reliefs of the sculpture. Hence discomfort, impatience, weariness, the liberty of a day of cynicism and folly, the quarrels which break forth for all sorts of causes, a pointed elbow, an iron-shod shoe, the fatigue of long waiting, had already, long before the hour appointed for the arrival of the ambassadors, imparted a harsh and bitter accent to the clamour of these people who were shut in, fitted into each other, pressed, trampled upon, stifled. Nothing was to be heard but imprecations on the Flemish, the provost of the merchants, the cardinal de Bourbon, the bailiff of the courts, Madame Marguerite of Austria, the sergeants with their rods, the cold, the heat, the bad weather, the bishop of Paris, the pope of the fools, the pillars, the statues, that closed door, that open window all to the vast amusement of a band of scholars and lackeys scattered through the mass, who mingled with all this discontent their teasing remarks, and their malicious suggestions, and pricked the general bad temper with a pin, so to speak. Among the rest there was a group of these merry imps, who, after smashing the glass in a window, had seated themselves heartily on the entablature, and from that point dispatched their gaze and their railleries both within and without upon the throng in the hall, and the throng upon the place. It was easy to see, from their parody gestures, their ringing laughter, the bantering appeals which they exchanged with their comrades, from one end of the hall to the other, that these young clerks did not share the weariness and fatigue of the rest of the spectators and that they understood very well the art of extracting, for their own private diversion, from that which they had under their eyes, a spectacle which made them await the other with patience. "'Upon my soul! So it's you, Joannes Frollo de Molendino!' cried one of them to a sort of little light-haired imp, with a well-favoured and malign countenance, clinging to the acanthus leaves of a capital. You are well named John of the Mill, for your two arms and your two legs have the air of four wings fluttering on the breeze. How long have you been here? By the mercy of the devil, retorted Joanne Frollo, 
these four hours and more, and I hope they will be reckoned to my credit in purgatory. I heard the eight singers of the King of Sicily intone the first verse of seven o'clock mass in the Saint-Chapelle. "'Fine singers,' replied the other, "'with voices even more pointed than their caps. Before founding a mass for Monsieur Saint-Jean, the king should have inquired whether Monsieur Saint-Jean likes Latin droned out in a Provençal accent.' "'He did it for the sake of employing those accursed singers of the King of Sicily!' cried an old woman sharply from among the crowd beneath the window. "'I just put it to you, a thousand livres parisi for a mass, and out of the tax on sea-fish in the markets of Paris to boot!' "'Peace, old crone,' said a tall, grave person, stopping up his nose on the side towards the fishwife. "'A mass had to be founded.' Would you wish the king to fall ill again? Bravely spoken, Sir Gilles Lacornu, master furrier of king's robes, cried the little student, clinging to the capital. A shout of laughter from all the students greeted the unlucky name of the poor furrier of the king's robes. Lacornu! Gilles Lacornu! said some. Cornutus et hersutus! Horned and hairy! another went on. He, of course, continued the small imp on the capital. What are they laughing at? An honorable man is Gilles Lecornu, brother of Master Jehan Lecornu, provost of the king's house, son of Master Mahier Lecornu, first porter of the Bois de Vincennes, all bourgeois of Paris, all married from father to son. The gaiety redoubled. The big furrier, without uttering a word in reply, tried to escape all the eyes riveted upon him from all sides. But he perspired and panted in vain. Like a wedge entering the wood, his efforts served only to bury still more deeply in the shoulders of his neighbors, his large, apoplectic face, purple with spite and rage. At length one of these, as fat, short, and venerable as himself, came to his rescue. Abomination! Scholars addressing a bourgeois in that fashion in my day would have been flogged with a faggot, which would have afterwards been used to burn them. The whole band burst into laughter. Hola, eh! Who is scolding so? Who is that screech-owl of evil fortune? Hold! I know him, said one of them. Tis Master André Mounier. Because... He is one of the four sworn booksellers of the university, said the other. Everything goes by fours in that shop, cried a third. The four nations, the four faculties, the four feasts, the four procurators, the four electors, the four booksellers. Well, began Jean Frollo once more, we must play the devil with them. Mounier, we'll burn your books! Mounier, we'll beat your lackeys. Mounier, we'll kiss your wife. That fine Mademoiselle Oudard, who is as fresh and as gay though she were a widow. Devil take you, growled Master André Mounier. Master André, pursued Jean Jehan, still clinging to his capital, hold your tongue or I'll drop on your head. Master André raised his eyes, seemed to measure in an instant the height of the pillar, the weight of the scamp, mentally multiplied that weight by the square of the velocity, and remained silent. Jehan, master of the field of battle, pursued triumphantly. "'That's what I'll do, even if I am the brother of an archdeacon!' Fine gentry are our people of the university, not to have caused our privileges to be respected on such a day as this. However, there is a maypole and a bonfire in the town, a mystery, pope of the fools, and Flemish ambassadors in the city, and at the university, nothing. Nevertheless, the Place Maubert is sufficiently large, interposed one of the clerks established on the window sill. "'Down with the rector, the electors, and the procurators!' cried Johannes. "'We must have a bonfire this evening in the Sham Gaillard,' went on the other, "'made of Master André's books!' 
"'And the desks of the scribes,' added his neighbor. "'And the beetles' wands. "'And the spittoons of the deans. "'And the cupboards of the procurators. "'And the hutches of the electors. "'And the stools of the rector. "'Down with them!' put in little Jehan as counterpoint. "'Down with Master Andre, the Beatles and the scribes, the theologians, the doctors, and the decretists, the procurators, the electors, and the rector!' "'The end of the world has come,' muttered Master Andre, stopping up his ears. "'By the way, there's the rector. See, he is passing through the place!' cried one of those in the window. Each rivaled his neighbor in his haste to turn towards the place. "'Is it really our venerable rector, Master Thibault?' demanded Jehan Frollo du Malin, who, as he was clinging to one of the inner pillars, could not see what was going on outside. "'Yes, yes,' replied all the others. "'It is really he, Master Thibault, the rector.' It was, in fact, the rector and all the dignitaries of the university who were marching in procession in front of the embassy, and at that moment traversing the place. The students crowded into the window, saluted them as they passed with sarcasms and ironical applause. The rector, who was walking at the head of his company, had to support the first broadside. It was severe. "'Good day, monsieur le recteur. Hola, eh? Good day there. How does he manage to be here, the old gambler? Has he abandoned his dice? How he trots along on his mule! Her ears are not so long as his. Hola, eh? Good day, Monsieur le Recteur Thibault. Thibault Eliator, old fool, old gambler. God preserve you. Did you throw double six often last night? Oh, what a decrepit face, livid and haggard and drawn with the love of gambling and of dice. Where are you bound for in that fashion, Thibault? Thibault de Adados? with your back turned to the university and trotting towards the town? He is on his way, no doubt, to seek a lodging in the Rue Thibault O'Day, cried Jehan du Monsieur Molin. The entire band repeated this quip in a voice of thunder, clapping their hands furiously. You are going to seek a lodging in the Rue Thibault O'Day, are you not, Monsieur le Recteur, gamester on the side of the devil? Then came the turns of the other dignitaries. "'Down with the beetles! Down with the mace-bearers! "'Tell me, Robin Puispin, who is that yonder?' "'He is Gilbert de Sui, Gilbertus do Soliaco, the Chancellor of the College of Autun. "'Hold on, here's my shoe. You are a better place than I. Fling it in his face. "'Saturnalitius mitimus eke nuces!' "'Down with the six theologians, with their white surplices!' "'Are those the theologians? "'I thought they were the white geese given by saint jean to the city for the fief of Rogny. "'Down with the doctors! "'Down with the cardinal disputations and quibblers!' "'My cap to you, Chancellor of saint jean "'You have done me a wrong. "'Tis true!' He gave my place in the nation of Normandy to little Ascanio Falzapada, who comes from the province of Bourges, since he's an Italian. That is an injustice, said all the scholars. Down with the Chancellor of saint jean vieve Oe, Master Joachim de la Dours! Oe, Louis d'Aouy! Oe, Lambert Hautemain! May the devil stifle the procurator of the German nation! and the chaplains of the Chant chapelle with their grey amices, cum tuniques grises. See you do pelibus grises foratis. Hola, eh, master of arts, all the beautiful black copes, all the fine red copes. They make a fine tale for the rector. One would say that he was a doge of Venice on his way to his bridal with the sea. Say, Jehan, here are the cannons of saint jean To the deuce with a whole set of cannons! Abbe Claude Chouart, Dr. Claude Chouart, are you in search of Marie la Gaffard? She is in the Rue de Glatigny. She is making the bed of the king of the debauchees. 
She is paying her four deniers, quatior deniaros. Out unum bom boom. Would you like to have her pay you in the face? Comrades, Mr. Simon Saguin, the elector of Picardy, with his wife on the crupper. Post equitem seclet atra jura. Behind the horseman sits black care. Courage, Master Simon. Good day, Mr. Elector. Good night, Madame Electress. How happy they are to see all that, sighed Joanne de Melendino, still perched in the foliage of his capital. Meanwhile, the sworn bookseller of the university, Master André Mounier, was inclining his ear to the furrier of the king's robes, Master Gilles Le Cornu. I tell you, sir, that the end of the world has come. No one has ever beheld such outbreaks among the students. It is the accursed inventions of this century that are ruining everything—artilleries, bombards, and, above all, printing, that other German pest. No more manuscripts, no more books. Printing will kill book-selling. It is the end of the world that is drawing nigh. I see that plainly, from the progress of velvet stuffs, said the fur merchant. At this moment midday sounded. Ha! exclaimed the entire crowd in one voice. The scholars held their peace. Then a great hurly-burly ensued, a vast movement of feet, hands, and heads, a general outbreak of coughs and handkerchiefs. Each one arranged himself, assuming his post, raised himself up, and grouped himself. Then came a great silence. All necks remained outstretched, all mouths remained open, all glances were directed towards the marble table. Nothing made its appearance there. The bailiff's four sergeants were still there, stiff, motionless, as painted statues. All eyes turned to the estrade reserved for the Flemish envoys. The door remained closed, the platform empty. This crowd had been waiting since daybreak for three things. Noonday, the embassy from Flanders, the mystery play. Noonday alone had arrived on time. On this occasion it was too much. They waited one, two, three, five minutes, a quarter of an hour. Nothing came. The dais remained empty, the theatre dumb. In the meantime wrath had succeeded to impatience. Irritated words circulated in a low tone, still it is true. "'The mystery! The mystery!' they murmured in hollow voices. Heads began to ferment. A tempest, which was only rumbling in the distance as yet, was floating on the surface of this crowd. It was Jehan du Melan who struck the first spark from it. "'The mystery! And to the devil with the Flemings!' he exclaimed at the full force of his lungs, twining like a serpent around his pillar. The crowd clapped their hands. "'The mystery!' it repeated. "'And may all the devils take Flanders!' "'We must have the mystery instantly,' resumed the student, "'or else my advice is that we should hang the bailiff of the courts, "'by way of a morality and a comedy.' "'Well said,' cried the people, "'and let us begin the hanging with his sergeants.' "'A grand acclamation followed. "'The four poor fellows began to turn pale and to exchange glances.' The crowd hurled itself towards them, and they already beheld the frail wooden railing which separated them from it, giving way and bending before the pressure of the throng. It was a critical moment. "'To the sack! To the sack!' rose the cry on all sides. At that moment the tapestry of the dressing-room, which we have described above, was raised, and afforded passage to a personage, the mere sight of whom suddenly stopped the crowd and changed its wrath into curiosity as by enchantment. "'Silence! Silence!' The personage, but little reassured, and trembling in every limb, advanced to the edge of the marble table with a vast amount of bows, which, in proportion as he drew nearer, more and more resembled genuflections. In the meanwhile tranquillity had gradually been restored. All that remained was that slight murmur which always rises above the silence of a crowd. "'Messieurs the bourgeois,' said he, "'and Mademoiselle the bourgeoises, 
we shall have the honor of declaiming and representing, before his eminence, Monsieur the Cardinal, a very beautiful morality which has for its title The Good Judgment of Madame the Virgin Mary. I am to play Jupiter. His eminence is, at this moment, escorting the very honorable embassy of the Duke of Austria, which is detained at present, listening to the harangue of Monsieur the Rector of the University at the Gate Baudet. As soon as his illustrious eminence, the Cardinal, arrives, we will begin. It is certain that nothing less than the intervention of Jupiter was required to save the four unfortunate sergeants of the bailiff of the courts. If we had the happiness of having invented this very voracious tale, and of being, in consequence, responsible for it before Our Lady criticism, it is not against us that the classic precept, nec deus interceit, could be invoked. Moreover, the costume of Signor Jupiter was very handsome, and contributed not a little towards calming the crowd, by attracting all its attention. Jupiter was clad in a coat of mail, covered with black velvet, with gilt nails. And, had it not been for the rouge and the huge red beard, each of which covered one half of his face, had it not been for the roll of gilded cardboard, spangled and all bristling with strips of tinsel, which he held in his hand, and in which the eyes of the initiated easily recognized thunderbolts, had not his feet been flesh-colored and banded with ribbons in Greek fashion, he might have borne comparison, so far as the severity of his mane was concerned, with a Breton archer from the guard of Monsieur de Berry. End of chapter 1